four, three, two, one. Sir, we are live now. Now we can start the meeting. All right. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, pediatric orthopedic module, uh, the se second session. And today we'll be learning about techniques of uh, biopsy. And we have uh, Dr. Mandeep Shah with us. Mm, sir practices in Ahmedabad in, at Spursh, which is an exclusive orthopedic oncology clinic. Sir is the past president of Indian Musculoskeletal Society. Uh, after finishing his MS orthopedics from VS General Hospital as a university topper, Sir did his oncology training at Tata Memorial Cancer Center in Mumbai, uh, followed by m multiple mm, fellowships and trainings in the US with uh, renowned uh, oncology uh, authorities in oncology and uh, amongst uh, in the uh, entire world and uh, we are grateful to have sir with us and thank you for sparing your time and joining us today uh, sir i'll shop, uh, stop my screen share and yes sir. so you can start your share So good morning, all of you. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, when Maulin asks me to do something, uh, you know, it is uh, more than, I mean, it's like, like an order than a request. So I, I can't say anything about it. But it, I, I can only say that it's always a pleasure to be here. I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. All right. So today we are going to talk about the most important part of uh, oncology practice. I mean, it may sound as petty or meager as a biopsy, but it is the most important step in the management of bone and soft tissue. And uh, when we talk about biopsy, we talk about five famous W's of biopsy. If you know these five W's, then you are qualified to do biopsy. What are those five W's? When should we do the biopsy? Which lesion needs to be biopsy? Who should do the biopsy? From where the biopsy should be taken? And how should the biopsy be done? So there are these five famous W's associated with biopsy and biopsy tech. But before I go there, I will take you through certain interesting cases. Okay. So this is a 12-year-old male and there was a swelling in the upper leg since three months. If you look at this x-ray, it was, there was something, uh, some sort of a uh, aggressive, sinister looking lesion in the upper end of upper tibial metaphysis with a soft tissue extension. Unfortunately, the radiologist thought that this is an osteomyelitis, the soft tissue extension that was there on the posteromedial aspect, he, he thought this is, that's an abscess. And report, based on these reports, the orthopedic surgeon did a debridement and curettage. He thought it's an osteomyelitis. He sent it for cultures, but he did not even send it for a biopsy. And this is how the patient presented to me after around six months. When he presented to me, he didn't have, he had not only had this one, but he had multiple metastases all over his body. And this patient succumbed despite a palliative amputation. This was a high grade osteocyte. You look at this next case. The 19 year old male had a fall from bike, fractured his femur. He did give history of mild pain in the thigh since last month or so. And his x ray showed a picture like this. Now, all of us can appreciate that these the bone ends or the fracture ends are not looking sharp, they are looking hazy. It looks like there was something going on there before the bio, before the fracture. And he did not understand that this is a pathological fracture. He thought this is a traumatic fracture and that is how. Oh, uh, no, sorry. So, he did get an MRI and the MRI reported that this looks like a simple bone cyst which has fractured. So he did a nailing. Now you could see that even after nailing, there is some sort of a matrix, you know, within the lesion. You can see that he did send the reaming material for histopathology, which was negative for tumor. So he was very happy. Okay, this is probably a simple bone cyst, or this was probably a traumatic fracture. It was no, not a pathological fracture. But this is how the patient presented to us. This was again a very high grade osteo. He needed a total tumor replacement because he had contaminated the entire canal. With this patient could have easily been handled with a distal tumoral replacement or maybe an intracalary resection, maybe a joint spine resection. Because of his intervention, it led to this kind of a 
picture which has a life changing consequences this, yes. reconstruction, this reconstruction will have a life changing consequences forget about function changing because we know for sure that when you meddle with the tumor when you do curettage or interlesional surgery on a malignancy it showers tumor cells into the circulation and it, and it increases the chances of metastasis look at this one more case this is a 38 year old female she had a pain in the knees in 6 months it gradually increased and it, there was a sudden onset of swelling and difficulty in walking this is how the picture was there was a la nice large uh, lytic expansive lesion in the distal uh, uh, femoral epiphysis with a very kind of a narrow zone of transition last uh, saturday we learned about reading the x rays is if, if you could see the zone of transition is pretty na pretty narrow pretty sharp but what you couldn't see is this certain small some extensions here the mri was done and mri was uh, was not the classical for a giant cell tumor as you could see there is a soft tissue extension there is this a small sclerotic or bone forming lesion inside there is a significant edema all around it this is more than just a giant cell tumor and but again the radiologist you know they reported that this is giant cell tumor or an aneurysmal bone cyst he didn't even he or she didn't even put a malignancy in a diffusion what happens surgeon was ready with his armamentarium curettage was done the very next day and it was actually a hybrid osteosis she was non metastatic on work up she did receive new adjuvant chemotherapy she did undergo undergo total knee replacement after a, a wide excision but it did develop multiple lung and bone metastases at just 7 months after treatment and she passed away within a year this is another lady 35 year old very classical giant cell tumor you know classical so bubble type of appearance very narrow zone of transition distal epiphysis of a uh, of tibia 35 year old lady you know this is what this could be nothing but a giant cell tumor and so was the thoughts so were the thoughts of the surgeon he did a nice you know curettage and multiple bone grafts and all these things at 9 months the swelling reappeared and this is how she presented to us and this was a again an high grade osteoarthritis this was a 13 year old boy area of you would want to take a uh, exam what do you think it is joans can you sir. listen to me yes sir joans? yes sir yes yeah. sir so can you describe this x ray yes sir so there is a lytic lesion in the distal femur in the metaphysis extending to the physis and there's a zone of transition is narrow and there is cortical thinning and probably a cortical breach laterally mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the matrix okay. is um, somewhat hazy in this like so it's probably a mixed type of some okay now you have got region. even mri films with you the mri is showing very classical free fluid levels can you see this yes sir so this is a lytic expansive lesion which is eccentric in the metaphysis with very narrow zone of transition with with fluid fluid levels what else it could be in a 13 year old boy this is the abc is it yes okay what you don't see here is when you want to call an abc on mri the fluid levels must extend to the all the corners and boundaries of the tumor there should not be any solid components like this what you are saying here can you say this something like this yes his fluid levels are there but you don't see fluid levels in this particular area that is why i have kept this particular image okay so again <clears throat> the surgery was done curettage and g bone was put and after some time the swelling kept on increasing the surgeon thought there is infection what he does he removes the g bone and puts in the antibiotic beads it doesn't occur to him that this could be something else when the patient came to me this was the situation okay so the thing is the list can go on you know for till for next 24 hours i can show you such cases over last 13 years i have gathered more than 1000 cases like this so the thing is even today you know when when we we have we follow this knee jerk reaction you know we call this a deadly uh, you know oculo brachial reflex when you see a potential case for surgery you just want to do surgery you know because your forearm muscle starts getting you know excited you know that is known as oculo brachial reflex so again this is one more case the soft tissue mass tumor in the in the lower leg as you can see here it's a heterogeneous lesion you know with, with this is a very very classical sarcoma 
But again, the radiologist reports this as a benign neurogenic tumor. Surgeon was ready. He did a debulking surgery. It was high grade undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. And this is how the patient presented to you. Now, the thing is, when you do something like this, you sometimes feel, okay, oh, should I screw the patient big time? If you are conscious, you would feel something like this. But at the end of the day, you may not, he may not be the only one who gets screwed because today the courts take a very strong strength against doctors. You know, the highest awarded compensation has been for a tumor case so far, which was 1 crore rupees. Okay. So we have to control the surgical itch. Okay. That is what this is a very famous dialogue from my mentor, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jyotindra Pandit. That you have to control this surgical itch. You know, when, whenever you see a patient, this potential for surgery, patient is begging for surgery, you want to just do the surgery because everything has come into place. It's like Kainath has sent this case to you. Oh, you just operate. That's not the case. You know, you should control your surgical itch because nobody knows the diagnosis. We have to establish the diagnosis that this, unless you see the target clearly, you may miss the target. And histopathological diagnosis is vital in work of postoscalation. These five or six cases, I told you two things. One, you should not assume that this is benign. Second, you should not trust the radiology reports blindly. Because most radiologists are absolutely untrained for musculoskeletal neoplasia reading. And, and as, a, as tumor surgeons, we, we always read our own MRIs. We only we rarely look at the uh, look at the uh, uh, reports of the of the radiology center unless it really comes from uh, from someone who is who is dedicated a musculoskeletal uh, radiologist. So pathological diagnosis is vital in work of musculoskeletal neoplasm. So what is the definition of biopsy? It's a procedure that yields adequate material in the best, uh, in the least traumatic way without theopardizing further for the definitive management. Okay. And before you do that, you should know the rules. As I said, the five W's, when, which, how, who, from where, and how. Okay. So let us take the first question. When to do the biopsy? <coughs> biopsy is undertaken after all the imaging studies have been completed and before the definitive management is done. Why after all the imaging studies? Because tissue reaction to biopsy can alter the appearance on imaging. And secondly, imaging can identify the best area for biopsy. Let me take you to this through this case. Now, this is a large destructive lesion in the proximal humerus. Okay. If you see the MR, there is a large necrotic area in the center of this. Now, if you take a biopsy from the central area, you would certainly end up uh, having a negative biopsy. You have to target these peripheral areas. So, unless you had done the bio MRI before you done the biopsy, you never know that this, this area you have to avoid. So, this thing is simply very important. Again, if you look at the MRI of this lesion, this is a lipomatous lesion, meaning by this is a fat containing lesion, mostly a lipoma. But when you see the MR, you see this, this solid area, which is looking very different from the rest of the tumor. So, there is this raises a suspicion of a D differentiation, which has. So, de-differentiated liposarcomas have not only different management, but it also has a very, very different outcome. So, you have to, when you do the biopsy, you have to target this area under CT scan guidance. So, that is exactly what we did. We targeted this area under CT scan guidance, guidance and, it, and it, did, uh, it did stamp that this is a de-differentiated liposarcoma and it was treated accordingly. Coming to the second question, which lesions need biopsy? Do all lesions need biopsy? Well, not really. If you look at this lesion, this is a classical osteoarthritis. Clinically and radiologically, this is a young adolescent boy. He has a nocturnal pain. He has a thigh wasting. He, he has this classical nidus on CT scan, which is on in the cortex. And on MRI, he has tremendous edema in the surrounding bone and marrow. That means this is nothing but an osteoarthritis. Similarly, these are very classical fibrous dysplasia lesions with typical deformities and ground glass type of appearances. So these are the lesions you may not biopsy. Again, osteochondroma, very, very classical metaphysical outgrowth with bony marrow continuity. You know that this is osteochondroma and you may proceed to treatment without a biopsy. Again, this is a simple bone cyst. Now, this kind of biopsy, a tumor surgeon can make this diagnosis without a biopsy, but nothing wrong in doing a biopsy when you are practicing periodic orthopedics or practicing tumors as a part of your routine practice. You do not lose anything by doing a biopsy. That, that should be the only take home from this particular lecture. When you do the biopsy, you are not losing anything. You may gain a lot of things, 
or you you are not losing anything that is something that you have to uh, inculcate in your brains again this is a very classical lipoma you know where is as you can see this is this lesion in the soft tissue which matches exactly with the surrounding fat the signal of this lesion matches around exactly around the fat on t1 on t2 on star on every imaging there is no de differentiated area there are no vascularity this is the lesion where you can biopsy you can you can avoid a biopsy and do a direct treatment and classical arteriovenous malformation or hemangiomas can also be diagnosed on radiology. In fact, this is one lesion which should be biopsied with radiology and uh, putting a needle should largely be avoided because it can lead to internal bleeding. But this, besides these particular five or six entities, all other benign aggressive lesions and all suspected malignant tissue tumors must be biopsied. So this lesion, particular lesion, as you can see here, it's it's a middle-aged man with a distal tumor uh, lytic lesion with a largely narrow zone of transition with homogeneous lytic matrix. So you think this is probably a benign giant cell tumor, but based on your assumption, you cannot treat this patient. You have to do a biopsy, document that this is indeed a giant cell. Coming to the third and most important questions, who should do the biopsy? Okay. Now again, uh, you know, being surgeons. When the patient has come to you, you feel privileged to do the biopsy or you, you feel entitled to do the biopsy on your uh, uh, yourself. But if you want to do the biopsy, you should again know the rules of biopsy. First, we, should, we will answer this particular question, who should do the biopsy? So if you look at this legendary paper from Professor Henry Mankin, he has, Report, he has written this paper twice, one in 1982 and one in 1996 about hazards of biopsies. And there's a pretty large number of lesions, large number of uh, cases, 329 and 597. He said major errors in diagnosis because of ill-performed biopsies are 18.2% in 82, reduced to 13.5% in 96. Complication rates are 17.3% in 82, 15.9% in 96. And unnecessary amputations had to be done in around 3% of patients, even in 1996, because of the heat performed by others. And he, you know, he had recommended, he, he had concluded that errors, complications, and change in the course of outcome were 2 to 12 times greater, which was statistically significant, when the biopsy was done in a referring center instead of in a treatment center. Meaning by, if the biopsy was performed in the dedicated tumor center, the, the errors and complications could have been avoided. And he recommended that on the basis of these observations, the society had suggested that the biopsy should be planned as carefully as definitive surgery and that careful attention should be paid to osepsis, skin handling, hemostasis and wound closure. The skin incision should be placed in such a manner so as not to compromise the subsequent surgery. And he had bluntly recommended that if the surgeon or the institution is not prepared to perform accurate diagnostic studies or proceed with definitive treatment for this patient, the patient should be referred to a treating center prior to biopsy. Okay. So the biopsy should be performed ideally by the surgeon who will be doing the definitive surgery. Okay. And this is something which is not liked by many general orthopedic surgeons, this statement. But anyways, we are in such a branch that uh, we, we don't want to be very popular, but we want to be upfront on the face to tell them that you should not do the biopsy. The biopsy should be done by a tumor cell. So from where to do the biopsy? That is the fourth question. Fourth question. Biopsy tract is a zone of contamination. Tissue which has come in contact with the disease. And that has to be treated as a part of this. Bone sarcomas, they have shown to recur locally from tumor seeding along the biopsy tract. Biopsy tract and immediate surrounding tissue should be removed and blocked with the tumor at the time of resection. And open biopsy, if done for sarcomas, the recurrence rates increases fivefold. That is from 7% to 38% when the biopsy scar is not removed at the final surgery. Are you able to understand these statements? Huh? Joans? Yes, sir. If there is any questions, then I would I would uh, request you to stop me, okay? And okay. ask me questions because this is, I have been given one hour and, and this lecture is not that long, so I have been taking it very slowly. Okay? Yes. 
if you have any questions and if you guys feel bored and sleepy then also stop me okay because i i don't have any eye contact so i don't understand what is happening at your end okay yes sir. so this is these are certain examples of of poorly performed biopsies as you can see these are curvilinear incision with large hatch marks there are multiple incisions these are all the tumor uh, zone of contamination this is a horizontal biopsy done from the popliteal fossa this is a biopsy done through the rectus muscle with large hatch marks as you can see here this is an arthroscopic biopsy now this is an absolute criminal thing to do because you have contaminated the joint because you have inserted the pro uh, the scope through the cartilage into the tumor so you have contaminated the joint also and then on the top of it you also had this kind of a open biopsy through the rectus so this is again you know we have done free flaps just to you know include the biopsy uh, scar in the resection because when you do something like this this atrocious things you have to you know and ultimately kya hota hai someone else is uh, you know uh, misdeeds they have to cover up and that is what uh, you know sometimes leads to disasters and when you want to do a biopsy it is a very nice paper which is freely available on internet just take a screenshot all of you this is anatomical based guidelines for coronary biopsy for bone tumors and implications of limb salvage surgery this is a available free pmc article and all of you who are aspiring to do a biopsy should read this article before doing the biopsy it talks about the anatomical based guidelines from where to take the biopsy it's very simple if you want to biopsy a proximal femur it is exactly uh, through the lateral uh, axis the, the the incision that you take for dhs or any proximal femoral plating that the same incision you will see that all the biopsies are done through the muscles and not through the anatomical planes okay our our orthopedic approaches are designed to go in between the planes of the of the muscles but when you do the biopsy you have to go through a muscle the idea is that the biopsy hole or the the track that you create that should be sealed off by the muscle which should fall over it so and if you do, if you say for example for uh, if you if you take a biopsy through a muscle the muscle uh, through a plane this is a plane where there is the area there is no resistance uh, to the seepage of the of the fluid which comes out from the and that is where it can easily you know lead to a lot of seepage of the of the tumorous uh, fluid all over the space so basically when you do the biopsy it has to go through a muscle so here it is through vastus lateralis entire shaft of the femur it is through the lateral side through the vastus lateralis again through the inferior or the posterior part of the vastus lateralis distal femur the most commonest site either anteromedial or anterolateral or medial or lateral it is never through the rectus again for tibia entire shaft it is anterior along the anterior anterior uh, border of the tibia proximal tibia it is anteromedial or anterolateral fibula it is again lateral throughout the throughout the line uh, for the proximal humerus it is the anterior fibers of the deltoid and not through the deltopectoral groove entire shaft of the humerus it is it is anterolateral and distal humerus it is lateral or medial uh, radius and ulna exactly the uh, it is exactly the line which you use for plating for radius and ulna and for scapula it is along this imaginary line which joins the uh, acromion tip of the acromion to the inferior angle and for pelvis it is along this utilitarian incision basically or uh, anywhere around the, along the lateral incision but do read this article it's a very interesting article it's a beautiful article very nice and elaborative picturesque article very self explanatory so you all of you should read this article. now coming to how to do the biopsy whether we should do open biopsy or a needle biopsy okay it's been it's been around close to two decades into oncology and i don't remember when i had done an open biopsy in in last two decades that would tell you that uh, you know bi open biopsy is really out of the vogue we really don't know, need to do open biopsies anymore we only do needle biopsy but there are certain advantages of open biopsy it gives you more representative tissue it is easier for a pathologist especially someone who is not a very experienced pathologist for muscular skeletal tumors grading may be more accurate because we know that the sarcomas could be heterogeneous some are low grade sarcomas some are high grade sarcomas you have tissues available for immunohistochemistry electron microscopy neogenomic sequences and all these things but there are multiple disadvantages one it is more invasive there is significant local contamination 
that much skin will have to be removed at the time of definitive surgery. It is an OT procedure. Anesthesia is required. Higher cost, it is not repeatable. And the lawyer is longer required. This, this is an open biopsy. So much of it so will be lost at the time of surgery. All the disadvantages of open biopsy are advantages of middle biopsy. It's a very little tissue contamination. There is a small surgical scar. It's an image guidance is, of, oh, is available. It is an outdoor uh, procedure. I never do it under local anesthesia. I always do it under short GA, but it's an OPD procedure. Patient stays in only for two hours. The procedure time is very short. The cost is much lower and it is repeatable. So we only do core little biopsies. And there is, there is enough literature going back uh, you know, uh, to more than two, three decades, 90s cars of papers have with more than 90, 97% of yield and accuracy. And uh, it is very safe and you can get a lot of uh, literature on, uh, on internet, which will tell you, convince you that needle biopsy is the standard of care. But why people are not still comfortable with doing needle biopsy is because they themselves don't know the principles of needle biopsy. We use this needle. This is Jamshidi needle. It has a trocar, a cannula, and a stellate. This is the new generation Jamshidi needle. So when you have this kind of a sclerotic mixed lesion, you have to do a co-needle biopsy. Okay, either this is sclerotic lesion here, or there is a mixed lesion. You have to do a co-needle biopsy, meaning by you have to take out cores. Let us take this, see this example. This is a sclerotic lesion in the upper end of tibia. Okay, this is likely to be osteosarcoma. Okay. We have marked the incision, proposed incision for the future surgeries, local anesthesia. Make a stab incision. Load your jumpshade needle with the trocar. You pierce the medial cortex with the trocar, then remove the trocar. Now you do a screwing movement with the cannula. Go inside the lesion for a couple of centimeters. I wobble it so that it dislodges that pore which has come inside the lesion and then take it out. And you will get this kind of a pore. You can move your needle in two, three different directions and take out your four pores, four pores, and that will be enough. Now you can see so much little tissue has been contaminated and you have got adequate. But when you have this kind of lesion, which is lytic lesion or cystic lesion or soft tissue masses, this kind of uh, this kind of method does not work because the material inside is so soft, it gets dislodged by the tumor, it doesn't come inside the, the needle. So what we do is core needle aspiration biopsy. That is the principle of this biopsy is very unique. So if this is a tumor, you know that we know that the sarcoma is heterogeneous, certain areas are low grade, certain areas are high grade, there is a lot of blood, there is a lot of necrotic areas. You want to sample everything together. What you do is, you put the needle inside the tumor, you attach a syringe uh, on, the, on this needle. This syringe is heparinized. This needle is also heparinized. You <clears throat> maintain a negative suction and move the, the syringe uh, the needle in different directions. So you are sampling this area, then you put needle and you are sampling this area, then you put here and sampling this area. You are sampling everything together and then you know you have all the your, your representation from all the areas of the tumor. So if this is suspected case of giant cell tumor, what you do is you take this heparin, this is uh, the syringe, the needle and the saline, everything is heparinized. The, the needle is inserted inside the lesion maintain the negative suction and do a two and throw movement. Your entry inside the tumor is only one, but within the tumor, you're moving your needle in multiple direction. At the end of it, you filter this lesion, uh, you filter this, uh, whatever is, uh, you, you, you see this once more. You understand what I'm saying? Everything is heparinized. What it will do is it will not let the blood clot form and that will not uh, allow the tissue to get entangled in within the clot. So you will see this much of tumors. This is another patient suspected ABC. Now the biggest criticism of needle biopsy is that 
in a cystic lesion, needle biopsy is largely ineffective. There is a technique to do a needle biopsy in a suspect in a cystic lesion because cystic lesions are largely filled with either blood or fluid, and there is very little tissue. When you do this, you have to do these things. When you doing this, you insert the needle inside, and with the with the help of the this needle, again. While you are aspirating, you just keep moving your needle in multiple directions. You have to do a multiple, uh, this here, you have to take out, do this multiple times because most of the things that you are aspirating is blood. Okay. Now you imagine so much of blood, it is filled with so much of blood. And imagine if you have to do an open biopsy here, it would bleed torrential. Okay. But here, just with a single stitch, the bleeding will stop. Okay. Again, this was a, indeed an aneurysm in bone cyst. Now, this is a suspected case of simple bone cyst. Again, you know, you make a drill hole here, put the needle inside, and then with the help of this needle, with the help of this tip of this needle, you keep rubbing this tip of the needle, you keep rubbing against the, the wall of the cyst, which will dislodge some of the linings. Then you suck it out. And your aspirate will have certain solid tissues like this. It will be enough to make a diagnosis of the Even for soft tissue tumors, I am using the same technique. Again, put the needle inside and aspirate with hyperionized syringe. Again, keep moving your needle in multiple directions so that your aspirate contains all the representative areas. So these are certain examples of poorly performed biopsies. You can see if the hemostasis is not achieved properly, this kind of skin infiltration will happen. You can see a big hack, big hatch marks, and we can open biopsy. Now this much of this much of skin will go in an upper TBI, and he will need a proper free flap. This is a horizontal scar, and you can see the drains have been exited from here. This is all all disaster. You can see there is this one huge scar here. There is one scar here. There is one scar here. These are all some these are absolutely unacceptable. Now, the commonest practice is to split the sample and send it to two different pathologies. Now, this is a very, very poor practice. Why? Again, the tumor is very heterogeneous. Some area may be low grade, some areas may be high grade, some areas may be necrotic. So, one pathologist will tell you this is benign, another will tell you this is malignant, third one will tell you this is non representative. So, whom will you believe? So the most important thing is that you send all the tissue to one pathologist. Let him see the entire thing, uh, uh, entire thing, retrieve the slides and blocks from him, and then ask the patient to take 100 opinions if he wants. Okay, with the slides and same slides and blocks. But please do not split the sample. Coming to the excision biopsy, excision biopsy should not be done by a non tumor surgeon. That is a that is a dictum. Excision biopsy should not be done by a non tumor surgeon. You should always do a biopsy before doing a doing a surgery. But for someone who is looking at tumors very, very regular, this is, even for them, this is, a, a, this is the Lakshman Rekha that they should not cross. They should not cross. Small, superficial, homogeneous, solitary tumor, which is in the limb girdle, not in the appendix, not in the actual skeleton. And it should be a primary lesion, not a recurrent. This is, it is strictly restricted for these tumors. So this is one area, which is one case, which is small, superficial, and very easily removable with wide margins. And when we are reset, when we are doing an excision biopsy, even if you are sure that this is benign, you should remove it as if you are exciting a sarcoma with wide margins. You should not take chance. So look, coming to biopsy failures, so there are two types of biopsy failures. One is a non-representative biopsy. That means that what you removed is not a tumor sample. It is something which you have, you have missed the target. And third, second is inaccurate biopsy, meaning by you've done a biopsy, you've reached a diagnosis. And when you do the surgery, the diagnosis of that final specimen does not match, does not match with your original biopsy. Okay. So these are the two modalities of biopsy failure. So biopsy failure can happen because of wrong targeting. As you can see, this is tumor is here and you have taken the biopsy from here. And it is the commonest cause of failure. And that is why CT or CM guidance is very, very important. If I think of myself, I started my practice in 2009. I was doing 98% of the biopsy in local anesthesia and 90% and of the biopsy without target. 
without CT or CM guidance. Today, I am doing 100% biopsies under anesthesia and almost 95% biopsy under guidance. So, as despite becoming more experienced, mature, and senior, I have started taking help from anesthetist as well as from the guidance. So, so if you look at this uh, paper, which talks about CT guided biopsy, again, it shows that. Uh, it, the yield and efficacy is exceptionally high. So this is how you do the biopsy. This is the case uh, of this is where this is a case of a suspected metastatic lesion in the L5. Take the patient under CM guidance. You see the lesion. Where is the lesion? You decide your trajectory. How you are going to do your biopsy? This is the level of your uh, needle insertion, and this is going to be your trajectory. Okay, so you 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 know you set the uh, CT scan at the same topogram, you mark, make the marking. Make the marking. You put the needle inside first, you put the KYR, you confirm that the KYR is within the uh, within the lesion, then you guide your, your jump sheet needle over it. Again, with the CT scan, you confirm that the needle is within the lesion, then again, use the same technique of, of aspirating with a heparinized syringe, and you will be, pathologists will be very happy to have these things. When you talk about non-diagnostic biopsy, there are certain distinct tumor characteristics which are notorious for giving a non-diagnostic biopsy, like this cystic lesion. As I said, if you don't do the biopsy with a particular technique which I just showed, you have to dislodge the membranes or the linings of the cyst and then aspirate it. Otherwise, we'll only get fibrin blood and serous weight. Again, fibrous lesions, it is very difficult, even the big lesions, you don't get any tissue. It's like a rubber. You know, when you, it's like a hard rock or a rubber, you put your needle in, you do a lot of things, but just that, that the yield is very, very little. And again, if you target large necrotic areas, you're likely to have non representative parts. Heterogeneity, as I just said, you just targeted low-grade areas and not targeted high-grade areas of biopsy. Initial biopsy will say that this is low-grade sarcoma and final report will say this is high-grade sarcoma. And the differentiation, as I, I as I just mentioned, if you're not targeted this particular area here, you just say that they would say, oh, this is a low-grade parosteal osteosarcoma. If you were targeted this area, it would have called you, it, it would have said that, okay, this is a high-grade, de-differentiated parosteal osteosarcoma. So, to minimize the failure, the diagnosis should be suspected strongly prior to biopsy, and biopsy should merely confirm what you are suspecting. So, this is an old man. This is a lesion in the proximal humerus, clearly malignant, as you can see, large soft tissue mass. And this is a very, very classical cartilaginous matrix. So this is nothing but a chondrosarcoma, as you can see here. So my biopsy form would mention that this is a chondrosarcoma. First differential is a chondrosarcoma. Then I do the biopsy when the report says this is chondrosarcoma grade 2. My jigsaw puzzle is complete. So all the pieces must match. History, clinical findings, histopathology, and radiological picture, everything should match. Otherwise, you have to reconsider. So, biopsy is the most important step in the work of, of musculoskeletal neoplasia. Before doing the biopsy, we must think. And after reading the biopsy report, we must think again. Okay, do not take anything on face value. This is a very famous quote by Love and Bailey about PR examination. You do not, if you do not put your finger in the rectum, you might end up putting your foot in it. I think all of you have read this. If you don't, I can extrapolate this. If you don't needle your patient first, you might end up screwing him. Because of failed trauma surgery can be rectified, what maximum it will end up in non inner or a mile. A failed knee replacement, failed arthroscopy, you can rectify with a knee replacement. A failed knee replacement, you can still do a fusion. But a failed onco surgery will not give you a second chance. You should not forget that we have all taken this oath. Okay. And sometimes, unknowingly, or unfortunately, sometimes even knowingly, we do harm to our patients. And that is something which is the avoidable. Thank you very much. Yes, Joanne? Yes, yes, thank you, sir, for the exhaustive talk. That this 
very nice we have a couple of questions um, yes we'll take those questions so thomas sir has asked um, in keeping Hi, with thomas. what was so he has asked some treat, uh, lesions can be treated without biopsy like uh, sbc some sbcs can mimic an abc so how do we go about those doubtful ones so usually uh, sbc is mimic like mimic like abc is that's primarily because you know those sbcs who fracture when when the sbcs fracture there is obviously a bleeding and that leads to development of fluid levels and that is where they, uh, you know, your pathologist will tell you, a radiologist will tell you that there is a fluid level, and that is why it is probably an aneurysmal bone cyst and not a simple bone cyst. But in, if you look at the larger X-ray picture, ABCs and SBCs look very different. SBCs are mainly central in the metaphysis and uh, very little ballooning. Usually, usually they are very little expansive. and that is where, and they are very clear metric. Sometimes you see this fallen leaf sign, which you usually. Uh, don't see in aneurysmal bone cysts. While ABCs are usually eccentric, more expansive, they look more aggressive, and uh, uh, they they cause thinning of the cortices, they they cause expansion of the periosteum and all these things. So if you look at the X-ray, your your first reaction on X-ray is what it is. So if you feel on X-ray, it is a simple bone cyst. It is simple bone cyst. So it's aneurysmal bone cyst. It is only aneurysmal bone cyst. MRI, uh, if it if it doesn't show any fluid levels, it's a homogeneously cystic lesion without a single uh, blood, uh, I mean, uh, uh, fluid level, you know this is simple bone cyst. But even if it shows a fluid level, if there is a history of fracture or an X-ray, you see a cortex, if you see a fracture healing line, then you should not give that particular fluid level too much of an importance. Uh, Mandeep, can I just follow, follow that up? So you're saying you should take advanced imaging uh, like an MRI in doubtful cases of a cyst, which can mimic an ABC. Is that right? To make a diagnosis, doing an MRI is certainly very important. Even a simple bone cyst, if you uh, a simple bone cyst, if you X-ray, you are you you on an X-ray, you feel this is a simple bone cyst. You should do an MRI and confirm. But if your MRI just shows a single fluid level that you should not give too much of importance if you see you also see a fracture line you know at some point of time this kid might have fractured leading to which might have led to some bleeding and that bleeding would cause that particular fluid level you know the the, yeah. the, the, the confusion happens because of that fluid level because most of the radiologists yeah. at the moment they see a fluid level they will write that this is an aneurysm bones and not a simple bones but abc but, and spcs would look very different on on x rays yeah. The, why the problem is in India, no? The cost of treatment also you have to keep in mind. So if we can do a definitive procedure, like you said, without a biopsy, makes a lot of sense for poor patients. So I was just thinking if uh, many ABCs, if you're very sure it's an ABC, you can go in and do a curatage bone grafting. But the problem is some of these ABCs turn up to be an telangiectated osteosarcoma. No, no, no. ABC, ABC is something that you have to do a biopsy. Yeah. Without the biopsy, you cannot treat ABC. It's only SBC. In yeah, but SBC, some of them are very difficult to say whether it's an a a SBC or ABC, just purely you, on radiology. Then you do a biopsy, no. That is what yeah. I said. So yeah. I, I, that's why I said biopsy can be avoided in simple bones is only in a tumor center. No, I, you guys are doing a lot of tumors, so you probably qualify for that. There's no question about it. The thing is, for someone who is doing tumor as a part of his regular practice, okay. tumor, yeah, yeah. do a biopsy. What do you lose? That's the thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mandeep. Good talk. Nice. I learned a lot. Thank you. So, so there was another one more question for osteosarcoma. Would you do post new adjoint chemotherapy biopsy to see tumor necrosis percentage or the post new adjoint chemotherapy? So <clears throat> we never do a post NSCT biopsy. That's for sure. Uh, nowadays, your metabolic imaging like PET CT scan, which will tell you very accurately uh, what is the percentage necrosis or what is the response to chemotherapy. It, they are quite sensitive. Uh, in If you have a baseline PET CT scan and then a PET CT scan followed by new adjoint chemotherapy, the difference in the standard uptake value would probably coincide with the percentage necrosis. That is one thing. You can... You always do an MRI post NSCT because you want to do a surgical planning. But it is important to do MRI for surgical planning, not really for looking at the percentage necrosis. But 
when you do an mri when you do a contrast enhanced mri that will also tell you whether the tumor how much tumor has responded to uh, to your uh, new adjoint key yeah so any role of intraoperative frozen section intraoperative frozen section uh, we usually uh, do for confirmation of margins whenever you are in doubt uh, that you okay, you have you have resected uh, proximal 18 cm of of femur but you want to confirm that your marrow margin is clear or not then you send some marrow sample for frozen section and uh, do the uh, wait till the report comes because if the marrow is positive you may go 3 4 cm down and take out that much part of bone nowadays with the advent of new i mean modern mri your margins are almost always clear if you planned your surgery well based on this mri because we take 3 cm margin beyond the extent of the tumor on mri so if the tumor extent is 12 cm you resect 15 you you tumor extent is 15 you resect 18 okay so that new current mris are so sensitive that uh, most of the times you don't need to do intraoperative frozen section plus visually also we have uh, we have visual input we see the MRI, we see the marrow and we realize that okay this normal looking marrow this is an abnormal looking marrow and that is where you so very very rare nowadays i of uh, in a in a years time i maybe send frozen section once or twice otherwise i don't really send it But yeah, I mean, uh, to confirm, not to confirm the diagnosis, but to confirm the margins. Yes. So that is for benign-looking tumors like osteofibrous dysplasia or like lipoma. They are malignant. There are malignant counterparts like adenomatoma or liposarcoma. In such case, how to take the call? Would biopsy be an overkill or not doing can be disastrous. so biopsy one question but one answer is very clear biopsy is never an overkill that is one thing. even if you biopsy a simple tumor lesion nobody is going to criticize you for doing that as far as you have done it properly okay that is one thing now this counterparts adenomatoma would look very different from osteofibrous dysplasia so osteofibrous dysplasia there is a there is a huge spectrum ofd adenomatoma like ofd ofd like adenomatoma adenomatoma de differentiated adenomatoma so there is a large spectrum so uh, most of these ofds are radiological diagnoses uh, they present as as just a bump or or an asymptomatic bump or cosmetic lesions and that is where we just keep them under observation uh, if you see any change in uh, in the x-ray picture over a period of time then we certainly are obligated to do a biopsy you again in the lipoma on mri it will be mri is extremely sensitive you get all the images t1 t2 stir fat suppressed and everything you would know that this is a simple lipoma because uh, it absolutely coincides with the rest of the fat of the body if you see any different areas as i as i showed in one of my uh, cases if you see any area which looks different from the rest of it you should do a biopsy that is So I had one uh, doubt, sir. What would, uh, how would it be the ideal case to approach the pathological femur fracture, which you had shown one of the early cases, which you had shown, like if such a case presents, so how would you approach it? We biopsy it, wait for the results for absolutely. A of days. So pathological fracture is not an emergency. Pathological fracture is not an emergency. The moment you see that the fracture is not normal, see a trauma surgeon has has looked at an X. Add fractures all the lives. Okay, they have seen more than a thousand fractured X-rays, and if they can't find, if if they can't uh, understand that there is a difference between this fracture and the fracture which I saw yesterday, then they have to go back to the drawing board. The thing is, the fracture ends are not sharp; they are hazy. The patient is giving you a history of pain in that area even before the key fracture. You are getting an MRI done. Okay. And the MRI is showing that there is some lesion. You are obligated to do a biopsy. You just tell the patient this is not a emergency. Patient will always be moaning in pain. He would always be requesting, sir, do something. I am having so much pain, so much pain. You just have to counsel him and convince him that this is a pathological fracture. The treatment of pathological fracture is not the treatment of fracture. It is the treatment of pathology. We have to know what is the pathology. For that, we need to do a biopsy. And the moment you tell them that you will get a report in within one day. That is an advantage that we have. 
here in Ahmedabad, that we can guarantee the patient. Sometimes we fracture patients that tell them that we'll get the report in six hours. You know, and they do the fast processing and they will give you a report in six hours. Okay, so that will be reassuring for the patient. The moment you tell them that if this is a cancer and if I nail this lesion, you might end up in an amputation. They will not demand you demand the surgery. You know, they will tell you, okay, sir, do the biopsy. Do a workup. Pathological fracture is not an emergency. Thank you. Okay, sir, I think we don't have any further questions as of now. So, so thank you, sir, for sparing your time and joining us. I hope it was uh, not too boring. Yeah, no, sir. Not at all, sir. Because... I hope there were some good take-home messages. Yes, sir. Right? So, one, one good take-home message is that you don't lose anything by doing a biopsy. That's it. When you are in doubt, do a biopsy. That's it. It's a simple procedure. It's a very simple procedure with very little complication rate and extremely uh, helpful in making decisions. Okay. All right, then. Yes. We should call it off. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, sir.